while around 20 civilians, women and children have left the Ukrainian-held Avostal steelworks in the besieged city of Mariupol. Well, they're the first group to leave the plant since Vladimir Putin ordered the vast industrial area completely sealed off. Well, Russia has continued to pound southern and eastern Ukraine with missile strikes, leaving many dead or wounded. Well, let's talk to Dr Stephen Hall, who's Professor for International Relations and Russia at the University of Bath. It's good to see you this morning. But the one thing that strikes me all of this, I mean, it's great news for those who've managed to escape, uh, and it's, we don't quite know how they've managed to do it, but we're talking about at least a 1,000 people in there uh, and, and only 20 getting out so far. It's a tiny number. It is indeed a tiny number. Um, and we are certainly a thousand, at least a thousand people are still in the uh, plant, as it were. There has been many attempts or numerous attempts to try and get some sort of ceasefire to move at least the civilians out. And the Russian authorities have rejected them all. I saw yesterday that uh, Pope Francis asked three times directly to Vladimir Putin to move, get the civilians out, and these were rejected. So at the moment, 20, 20 civilians have managed to get out, and that's wonderful, but there are still many, many more behind. Mm. And Stephen, can you describe the situation on the ground? What are the conditions like at this steelworks? And how likely is it that these 1,000 people, these civilians, will get out? From what I've seen, and obviously I, I'm not in Mariupol at the moment, uh, so it's, um, you know, from what I've seen from videos and uh, from talking to people who are uh, in Ukraine, it's a vast, vast area of the city um, and people are living in bunkers underneath the plant. There's also a field hospital that's been shelled as well with wounded. So it's a mixture of soldiers and civilians from what I've heard. Um, and they are surrounded by Russian troops. There's very little water, little food, uh, little sanitary conditions as well. Um, and so it's very much a siege, as you would expect uh, from the medieval times. It seems, I mean, in terms of international relations, never mind in terms of sort of um, uh, military strategy, it seems very odd that they would want to seal off this area and prevent these people getting out. In a sense. I mean, there's, a, there's an issue if they have got armed soldiers there. Of course, that changes the dynamic a little bit. Yeah. But we know a lot of these people are just civilians. What can, what can possibly be the benefit from Putin's perspective of, of trying to keep these people there when we know, you know, ultimately their lives are very much at risk if they stay there for much longer? Well, I mean, Russian, me Russian media has and only until relatively recently admitted or denied that there were civilians there. We also have to remember that um, the battalion in question at least in part, is the Azov Battalion, a group that Russia has vilified for neo-Nazi links, whether rightly or wrongly. Um, and this has always been a battalion or a group of people that the Russians have used to justify their idea that Ukraine is a neo-Nazi state. And so they are less than willing, let's say, to try and get allow the Azov Battalion to leave. Their belief is that there aren't civilians there, and they've only recently admitted that perhaps there are. And so they don't want to allow this group to leave for fear that the Azov Battalion can regroup um, and fight again, fight another day. They want to have some sort of moral victory, having defeated um, the principal alleged neo-Nazi faction. I'm very interested in how this is going down in Russia because it was put to them that this was a special operation. It was going to take two or three days. We're now on day 66. How much of this is getting back to Russian people, scenes like we're seeing in Mariupol? And how are they feeling? Oh, it looks as though we may have lost uh, Dr. Stephen Hall there. We will look to reconnect with him. A very interesting conversation. He may actually be back with us. Dr. Stephen, are you back with us? 
Yep, I, don't I know hope you caught the, the end of my question get, there. So that's, that's good. <laughs> yes. We are we are reconnected with you. I was just um, asking you how much the Russian people know about this um, and how they're how they're feeling. It's an interesting question, um, and it's hard to really say how they're feeling. I think there's a, you know, we looking at opinion polls, both non-regime and pro-regime. Putin's approval rating is high at about 81%. This is in part because Russians believe that they are liberating Ukraine from Nazis. This is the Second World War all over again. Um, and that they are also supportive of this special military operation because the regime has not called it a war. Russians don't like war, hence the SMO. So it's difficult to say in terms of opinion polls. I think from people I've spoken to from read it, you know, do it, analyzing what's what's happening on the last on the last 66 days, the Russians to an extent are living in denial. Um, they're only given the information, most Russians get their information from the state television. So they're only given a certain uh, viewpoint, let's say, but it is starting to or information is starting to come through. But it's always the case that people choose the message that they themselves believe. And I think that the majority of Russians are living in a state of denial. They don't believe that the Russians are doing what they're doing in Ukraine. When they're told, they believe that the Ukrainians are shelling their own cities. Because of the linkages, cultural and historical, between Russians and Ukrainians, many Russians have Ukrainian uh, family. So even when they're phoning up their family in Ukraine and their family are telling them what's happened in Kharkiv, Kiev, Mariupol, they simply don't believe them. And so there seems to be a cognitive dissonance that's occurring in Russian society. And this will take a long time. Once, If the sanctions start to bite by mid-May, mid-June, then perhaps we'll start to see a change when Russians are, have their wallets their wallets are affected. But until yeah. that time, they are supportive of the Kremlin, of the Russian authorities, although 81% perhaps is a bit too high. Yeah, OK. Look, Stephen Hall, it's really good to talk to you this morning. Thank you very Thank you. much indeed. Isn't that important, though, the idea of... It's why I think what we do is important, because what we give a voice... Whatever your views are, as long as they're legal... Uh, we'll give them a voice. Now, there's lots of things come through, lots of views come through that we don't agree with, mm. but, but it's about having your voice heard. Just because I don't agree with what you may be saying doesn't mean you're wrong at the end of the day. Yeah. And I think there's, it just shows the power. If you, if you don't give, if you really restrict people's views and what access they have to different views, how damaging that is mm. for society. Mm.